Well, if you have your Bibles, let's go to Isaiah 51, and I want to share something very, very near and dear to my heart, and that's the difference between your new condition in Christ, in your spirit, versus your condition that still remains, even after you get saved, after your flesh, after your flesh. In other words, we have to all learn to walk after the Spirit that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I struggled unnecessarily and became a casualty, an unnecessary casualty in the kingdom of God because I just could not reconcile the Scriptures. The Scriptures would say one thing about me and, and everything in my life seemed to testify of the opposite. And I didn't know how to reconcile all these positive things God is saying about me. But then I look in the mirror and go, who's he talking to? Yeah. God would say things like, you're more than a conqueror through him that loved you and gave himself for you. And I'm thinking, if I'm more than a conqueror, being a conqueror is not all it's cut out to be. <laughs> because I'm getting conquered by everything and everybody. If I'm a world overcomer, why is the world crashing down on me? And it just seems like I struggled in every area of my life. And so there were these paradoxes that I didn't know how to reconcile. There were these anomalies in Scripture that just didn't make sense to me. And I struggled again unnecessarily. And so I want to settle some things and encourage you today in who you are in Christ versus who you're not after the flesh. And why is it? Why is this heavenly treasure, Jesus, put in such an earthly, weak vessel? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that we have this treasure, and the treasure is Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory. But it says it has, we have him in this, this earthly vessel. And vessel there means a pot, a potter's pot, clay pots were the vessels of that time. And so he's saying, you've got on the inside of you this treasure, Jesus himself, but it's still in a earthen vessel, a clay pot. And then it explains why. He says that the excellency of the glory and the power may be of God and not of us. Boy, I didn't even get a nod to God. That reconciled everything for me. Why am I still so weak after the flesh? So that I'll never put confidence in my flesh. Right. Why am I still so weak and even unworthy and unrighteous after my flesh? So that I will never glory in my flesh. I went from feeling unworthy about my flesh and weaknesses to, to glorying in them now. Instead of hiding them, ignoring them, denying them. A lot of Christians put on an act because they don't know how to reconcile again their flesh and the weakness of their flesh. And why did God do this this way? I guarantee you it'll produce humility. If you ever by revelation see the weakness of your flesh and why, but the power and glory of your born again spirit and why, It'll make you humble. It'll keep you humble. It'll keep you dependent upon the Lord. Why do I need to know without God I'm nothing that I'm going to teach you today? So that I don't get up here without Him. Okay, that didn't fly. A lot of preachers, man, they, they just, they, before they get up, they'll say things to God like, just get me introduced, Lord, and I'll take over from there. How many of you know, after I get in, introduced, I better depend on the Lord if I'm going to have anything happen of eternal value. A lot of Christians, they live for the Lord and they start seeing success and then they put confidence in their flesh instead of learning to keep putting your confidence in the Lord that's on the inside of you, the power of the Lord that's on the inside of you and the might of the Lord that's on the inside of you. So look at Isaiah 54 and here's where it starts for me and I hope it helps you. Listen to me, Christian Ministries Fellowship. Evidently, nobody was listening yet. <laughs> Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. You who seek the Lord. Can I get a, get a witness? That's you today. Listen to me, you that are seeking the Lord. Listen to me, those of you that are seeking after and following after righteousness, who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you're hewn, 
cut out. And the hole of the pit from which you were dug. And look to Abraham your father. And Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Four things that we're supposed to listen to. Look to the rock from which you've been cut out. Never forget and keep looking unto Jesus now, the author and finisher of your faith. How many of you know that you're born again of an incorruptible seed by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever? Every one of you who know Jesus, you're a chip off the old block. Hallelujah. You've been cut out of Christ himself, born again, and become the sons and daughters of God in your inner man. In your spirit. And he says, do not forget that. Keep looking to the rock of which God cut us out of. But then he says, don't forget the pit from which you were found. It it amazes me how so many Christians can can be delivered from such horrendous things. And and then serve the Lord for a while. See some success. See some blessings. uh, See some good things in their life. And, and begin to look down at other people still in the pit. The only way you can condemn other people that are in the pit is if you forget you got found and dug out of a pit. God wants us to remember what we weren't when he found us so we can give him praise and glory from our hearts for who we are now in Christ. Hallelujah. You never forget where you came from. If you were, if you were bound by drugs... God doesn't want you to forget that. He just doesn't want you to be condemned about it or feel unworthy or disqualified by it. But he certainly doesn't want you to look at somebody bound by drugs now and be self-righteous. Hallelujah. No, you're supposed to look at them and go, oh, man, I've been in that pit. Let me help you get out of that pit. God got me out of that pit. Christ can deliver you from anything and everything. And he did me. I identify in my flesh with the bondage you're still bound by. But I identify with Christ now and he is set me free. He has delivered me and called me out of the pit into his marvelous light now, and he'll deliver you out of your pit. Amen. Never forget where you came from. Never forget the pit that God found you in and how he saved you, delivered you, loved you, was kind to you, etc., etc. And then he says, remember Abraham. Remember, we're living a life of faith that makes the impossible possible. You are supposed to get up every day as if this is an adventure and remember Abraham, the father of our faith, and that by faith, our God makes impossible things possible, that God promised him, and the same God that promises is the God that performs. Any promise that's made, the guy promising has to perform. My children learned this early, and they used to manipulate me, and if they couldn't manipulate me, they would go to their mama and try to manipulate her then. They knew all they had to get out of me was a promise. If I would even by mistake make a promise, now the fulfillment is on me, not them. Does that make sense? A promise is made and then whoever makes it has to perform it and there's no condition on the purpose you, on the person you promised. And Abraham was promised by God and God eventually Performed, And we're supposed to look unto Abraham. We're supposed to remember Abraham and know, hey, God has made me a promise. I have embraced his promise. And if it takes 50 years, I believe it's going to come to pass. I believe God's going to keep his promise. He was 100 years old, saints. Sarah was 90 when they made a baby. That should give some of you hope. I mean, Abraham's 100 years old and he's looking over at Sarah and she can hardly wash dishes, much less make a baby. And he's 100. I won't get into that. Thank God I'm in a hurry. We're supposed to remember we serve the God of the impossible. We serve the God and by faith all things are possible to me now. That's exciting. That makes life an adventure and a journey into the promises of God and serving the God who performs whatever he promises. And hey, he says, don't forget Sarah. Don't forget Sarah who was barren, but brought forth 
the promised seed. After our flesh, many times we feel so barren, but how many of you know, in Christ, we can be fruitful in this life, hallelujah. So those things are things that we're to look unto, we're to remember, we're to, we're to be steadfast in. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, and this is where my journey began after, after May of 1980. This was the first scripture the Lord gave me after I had a vision of the open an open vision of the cross and everything shifted for me. I had met the Lord, truly been born again in 1965. And, and yes, young people, there was a 1965. <laughs> and I had an encounter with Jesus that if I could take time, I mean, it was very, very real. And uh, yet I failed miserably for 15 years. I was discouraged Beyond belief for 15 years. I failed at everything for 15 years of my Christian experience. And then I, I meet Sue, who I went on to marry after I met her. And she witnessed to me, I had an open vision of the cross in her living room. An open vision of Jesus on the cross. And I saw my identity in Jesus. I saw me inside of Jesus. I can't explain this. I'd never heard it uh, at church. Uh, so it was just foreign to me that here's Jesus. I know it's Jesus, but I see me on the inside of him. And I see all my sins come into his body. And I see God's wrath on Jesus for me and against me. And when he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he was raised from the dead, I have this vision. And I see me in him after the resurrection. And the me I see in him is a different me than I saw that died on the cross with him. I was raised together with him. I was seated together with him. He looks over at me at the end of the vision and says, We will rule and reign together in the earth forever. For it, it, it rocked my world. It, it tore me up so bad I went three months uh, and couldn't quit crying all the time. Just every time I'd think about it, I'd start bawling and crying because it was so alive in me. And then, and then I, I know visions can take people away from the kingdom of God. Many of the cults today and false religions came out of a vision. So I immediately got in the scriptures 10, 12 as much as 15 hours a day for three straight months. Is this in the Bible? And I was shocked. How can I go to church my whole life and no one ever tell me Galatians 2.20 and that I died with Christ? How can I go to church and no one tell me Romans chapter 6 and how I was buried with him in baptism of death? How can no one teach me Ephesians chapter 2 that when he was raised, I was raised together with him. When he was seated, I was seated with him in heavenly place. Everything I saw is called the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the power of God in your life. Once you see who you are in Christ and after Christ in your spirit and learn to walk after it, you'll break the weakness of the flesh, the bondage of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. All of these things that bind people, even Christians, are broken through your new identity with Christ. And so in 2 Corinthians is where God took me to begin with. Look at verse verse. 14 in chapter 5, we've got to get the context somewhat. For the love of Christ compels us because we thus judge or we judge thus. That if one died for all, then, we're all, then we all died. Yep. Did you see that? Yep. We all what? We all it didn't say we're dying daily. Hmm. Oh, wow. You better get a revelation of your old man died, not dying. Because how many of you know you can't bury dying people? Y'all know that in Missouri, right? You can't bury dying people. You can only bury dead people. And your old man was crucified with Christ and died and was buried in baptism of death. And now you've been raised a new man in, in Christ. And he... And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no man according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no, no longer. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now all things are of God. Who's reconciled us unto himself and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation to wit or to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And I'm talking fast because you want to go home after a while. That's a lot. Yes, it is. And it used to confuse me. Just like we have this, we have this, this heavenly treasure in an earthen vessel, a clay pot. A cracked pot. How many of you know Christians are still crack pots? <laughs> we're, we're all crack pots at some level. And yet Jesus is in us. Yet God's glory is in us. Yeah. Yet we've been united to Jesus as messed up still as we are after the flesh. Oh, yeah. And he says that we're supposed to know no one after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. No more what? After the flesh. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You have to learn to come to know yourself after Christ, in Christ, versus after your flesh. You're one of the people you're not supposed to know anymore after the flesh. And this is offensive. It shouldn't be. But I can cause no small stir in any church I go into. If I was to take the time, I won't. Thank you, Lord. To talk about how we all still see ourselves after the flesh. The woke culture that we've been talking about all, all week, they're obsessed with the flesh. They're obsessed. With judging everybody and seeing everything after the flesh and trying to fix everything after the flesh. And we can't be fixed after the flesh. We have to walk after the spirit to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's so much confidence that people have in their flesh. The color of their skin. Their IQs. Their lofty opinions, their philosophies, their way, and how bright they think their way is after, after the flesh. So many churches major on the flesh instead of majoring on the spirit. My problem for those 15 years of defeat is all I knew about Dwayne Sheriff was my flesh, my outer man. I went a little bit further in discovering my soul. I have a soul, a mind, a will, emotions, my personality, thoughts. But no one, go to church my whole life and no one tell me there's a third part of me, my spirit, that's real. And that I'm creating, I'm created in the image and in the likeness of a triune God. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're created in the image and in the likeness of God. You too are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, I pray the God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Not holy, H-O-L-Y. I pray the God of peace sanctify you holy. I pray your whole spirit. And soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. And faithful is he who hath promised who will do it. Do what? Present me holy spirit, soul, and body at his appearing. Did you know your bodies are not holy? That's why if the Lord tarries, it has to be sown in the earth. And when the Lord returns with the saints that have gone home before you, You'll get a brand new body. Your body has to be sown in one form and reaped in another form. Your bodies are not redeemed. They're saved, but they're saved by hope. Future tense, Romans chapter 8 says. Everybody okay so far? My body is saved by the return of the Lord, the resurrection. My soul is being saved every day as it's renewed to the truth. That's the transformation that's taking place in all, all of our lives as our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions are being harnessed. 
and renewed in Jesus, our lives are being changed or transformed, Romans chapter 12 says. So my body will be saved, future tense, by the resurrection. My soul is being saved by the washing of the water of the word of God. And my spirit is saved right now, born again, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, one spirit with the Lord, righteous and truly holy, the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, blessed coming in and blessed going out. And if you don't start shouting, nodding your head or something, I'll preach the whole Bible of how blessed you are. Because people go to church their whole life like I did and they never discover there's a part of me that the Bible is a mirror of. If I want to know what my flesh looks like, I look in a mirror and cry. If I want to know what my soul looks like, I meditate, I think. But how do I contact my spirit? Boy, this, is, this, this was the struggle of Pentecost and Pentecostals my whole life. Is how do you connect with your spirit? How do you discern your spirit? How do we connect with God who is spirit? Thou must worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Not in your emotions. I'm not saying we don't emotionally serve God. But how many people go to church for a a spiritual buzz? Dopamine of the spirit. Make me feel good, preacher. Make me feel good, preacher. I grew up in churches where, man, if you didn't feel something, God wasn't there. Why do you know God was here today? I felt him. Ooh, ooh. You couldn't prophesy unless you got weird. Something weird had to come on you. Ooh. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. People don't even know when I'm prophesying most of the time. Because it's just natural. Sorry. I, I, no, that's not. For you two, it seems to be going well. And, and that's good. No, that's good. If it doesn't go well right here, I might as well shut this puppy down. Cause, so it has to go well here. I'm good with that. The bottom line is, how do I contact my spirit? By revelation and faith in the scriptures. The scriptures are a mirror of the spirit world. And if I want to, again, look at my outer man, I look in a natural mirror. If I want to know what my inner man looks like, I take the word of God and it's a mirror. And what it says is a fact and it's true. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's me. He's a new creature. I am in my spirit a new creation, a new person, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything I was in my spirit passed away and All things have become new. Where? In my spirit. All things are new in there. Your spirit never gets depressed. Your spirit never gets discouraged. Your spirit doesn't know anything but joy and peace. And goodness. And kindness. And if you can learn by faith to connect with your born again spirit and walk after the spirit... You'll see all these wonderful promises begin to manifest in your life and experience them in your homes, in your businesses, in our churches. And yet many people go to church their whole life and they remain like I was, confused. Like I know the Bible says, but I know it says I'm righteous and truly holy, but if you only knew what a, what a mess up I am, amen. They even, feel, they even feel like maybe they got saved, but they were at the shallow end of the gene pool. That somehow or another, this born-again thing ain't quite what I thought it was going to be. I know it says God made me righteous, but man, I have these bad thoughts. I have an attitude toward my spouse at times. I hollered at my kids the other day. I know I'm not talking to y'all. God sends me all over the world to talk to people that aren't there. You ever feel that way? (laughs) All I knew was what the mirror told me, and I hated my hair. I used to be thin. No, you should have saw me before I OD'd on steroids. I used to be thin. I had hair that wasn't normal. 
I'm not saying it's normal now. I'm saying it's acceptable now. I had an afro, literally from shoulder to shoulder in the 70s. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed I'm white. I know you don't walk after the flesh. You don't judge after appearance. You're so spiritual. But uh, I could jump in a swimming pool, and when I would come up, my hair would still be perfect. I had some girlfriends that tried to straighten it for me and ironed it, and I looked like Bozo the Clown. It was, <laughs> let it go, young people. Uh, it was terrible. Early in the ministry, people would ask me, now they've heard me. Most people who come to a meeting have heard me, so they don't ask me anymore, but people would come up to me and go, is that natural? And I would say, you mean somebody would pay to have this done to their head? <laughs> of course it's natural. I hated it. I hated my voice. In May of 1980, I have an open vision of the cross. I feel God calling me into ministry. I attend a church, first time in, in, in three or four years, and a man prophesies over me, Colonel Holt, 40, 42, 43 years ago, prophesied over me and said, your voice will be known around the world. I looked around and went, who are you talking to? My voice? I hate my voice. And yet God said, first prophecy ever prophesied over me, and it's come to pass, is my voice will be known around the world. I gave away all my stuff when nobody was doing it. We've given away hundreds of millions of, of product. And, and <laughs> I remember struggling with giving it away because nobody was doing that, but that's what God told me to do. And, and my second thought after God told me to do it was, well, nobody will take them. And then I found out God has used my voice and that if anybody listens to me, it's not because I'm Charlton Heston. It's not because I have this beautiful voice. No, they hear the voice of the Lord and their lives are changed. And it literally saved my ministry in the sense of people wouldn't take my stuff unless they were seeking God. It's just amazing how we're nothing after the flesh, yet we glory in the flesh. We get condemned over our flesh. We feel unworthy over our flesh. And you're not even supposed to know yourself after the flesh. I'm French Indian after the flesh. It has not benefited me a thing. On my grandmother's side, on my dad's side, she was full-blooded Indian. On my mother's side, my grandmother was full-blooded French. It has not benefited me a bit. Maybe I'm a savage lover. <laughs> but the jury, the jury may still be out on that, amen? But how many people, how many people brag after their flesh and their roots? Caught up in their roots and their family tree, not realizing your family tree is the Charlie Brown tree, dude. You, if you trace your roots back far enough, you'll have to trace it all the way back to a drunken sailor in Adam. We all came out of one man. And that one man messed us all up after the flesh. And the second man, the last Adam, has fixed us after our spirit man, our born-again spirit man. You've got to find out your roots in Christ. Instead of your roots after your flesh. It's our flesh that divides up all our churches. We're so carnal. Let's go over things quickly. That was my introduction. I apologize. <laughs> but let me give you four things as quick as I can that are realities of your flesh. And God reveals these things to us not to condemn us, not to make us feel unworthy, not to disqualify us from anything. He, he reveals flesh so, like Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, you will put no confidence in your flesh. Why do people put so much confidence in their flesh? They don't have a reality of how, 
how weak their flesh is and no good their flesh is. Romans chapter 7 verse 18, Paul says, For I know, I love those scriptures, for I know, I guarantee you, people today don't know this, but Paul said, For I know that in me, that is my flesh, is no good thing. You'd be surprised how many Christians think in their flesh there's a lot of good things. They think their flesh is USDA certified flesh. (laughs) And how many of you know there's no good thing in any of our flesh? And here's a revelation. i got to get going with the four things. But I was confused even after the vision. I thought my flesh would get better. I thought I would get better. I thought spiritual maturity was me getting better. Not realizing spiritual maturity is Jesus getting bigger in me. I thought I would one day be be kind. I would be kind. And then I discovered without God, I'm not kind. There's no kindness in me without God. Any kindness in me is Jesus in me, the hope of glory. It'll hit you eventually. Not today, probably. But it will hit you one day. You're not getting any better after the flesh. You, you, this is why, this will answer the question, how could somebody, how could that preacher that's got that huge ministry, known the Lord for 40 years, how could he run off with the secretary? Flesh. It doesn't matter how anointed you are, it doesn't matter how long you serve, serve God, after your flesh, if you walk after your flesh, you will die. That's not talking about physical death. You're going to die whether you walk after the spirit of the flesh regardless. When he said, if you walk after the flesh, you'll die. It doesn't matter how far and much you've grown in Jesus. If you choose to walk away from dependency and humility in God and yield to your flesh, you're as capable today after the flesh of any sin that anyone has ever committed on the planet. That's why you put no confidence in the flesh. That's why when you glory, you glory in the cross. Hallelujah. That man, I am what I am by the grace and mercy of God. It keeps you humble. All right, four things. And and there's only one that you're really not going to like. And so I'll go fast through it. Go to John 15. John 15. The first one is, without God, we can do nothing. I bet there's not a handful of people in here that really believe it, that it's a revelation. Man, that without God, I can do nothing. Without God in my life, I can't be holy. Without God, I can't do good. Without God, I can't really know God or good. Without God, I can't be kind. I can do nothing without God. And yet Jesus said in John 15, here in verse 1, I'm the true vine, my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, he purges it. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That it may bear more fruit, or he purges or prunes it. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken unto you. It's the word that purges you and cleanses you from the filth of the world that we're swimming in. He goes on to say, abide in me and I in you. Because the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You are the branches. Get this straight, Jesus said. I be the vine. You be the branches. If you'll abide in me, the vine, as a branch, then you will bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now, this is my bad. I tried to compliment. I really did your media department earlier this week. Uh, I should have given them a, a just a picture for you, so just Work with me. Use your imagination. Uh, Jesus says, you know, I'm the vine over here. I'm the vine. You're the branch. Okay? Branch. Vine. Branch. If you abide in me, the, the, the vine, then you'll bear much fruit. Say this quickly with me. Three things. Vine. vine. Branch. branch fruit. fruit. You never become the vine. And you never become the fruit. Now we have fruit loops throughout the body of Christ. <laughs> Just go to church, you'll meet them. Uh, 
See, I'm not, I'm not confused. As I grow in Jesus, I never become the vine. You separate me from Jesus and faith. There's no more power. All the power. All the virtue. All the glory. Everything is in the vine. Comes through the branches connected to it. And then you bear fruit. I never become kindness, fruit. I'm the branch. And I'll always be a branch. And as long as I abide in the vine, I be an awesome branch. And as long as I abide with Jesus and have faith in Jesus and be loyal to Jesus, man, there's all this fruit popping out of my tree of holiness, goodness, meekness, temperance, gentleness, love and joy and peace and good works. And man, I got to be careful not to think one day I'm the vine. Look at me. Now let's look at Jesus. And I better not get mistaken thinking I am the fruit. Because without him, I can do nothing. But here's the good news. We're not without him. It's a paradox. You need to know without him, you can do nothing. Why do I need to know that? So I don't live without him. So that I never forget him. So that I look under the rock that I've been cut out of. So that I never forget the pit that he took me out of. And that I know any good thing in my life is God. Hallelujah. Praise be to Jesus. Hallelujah. And mean it. And mean it. Now, a lot of people said in church, they learn learn the the language, the terminology, and they'll say, without God, I can do nothing. And then they turn around and live their whole life without God. So they get the verbiage, but they don't get the revelation. All right, number two. Let me go ahead and say Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can't do all things. Without him, I can do nothing. But I'm not without him by faith in Jesus and this new born again spirit that's one spirit with the Lord. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Through Christ that strengthens me, I can overcome the temptations of the world. I can overcome the flesh. I can overcome anything the devil throws at me. So in one hand, I can do nothing. I'll never forget it. That's the pit I was, was dug out of. On the other hand, man, thank you, Jesus. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Those two seem to be polar opposites and a paradox, but they harmonize in Jesus. All right, number two. Number two, without God, without him, I have nothing. Go to 1 Corinthians 4. You just don't hear Enough of this in balance. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. So you can never think beyond yourself or of yourself beyond what's written. It's written, I'm a new creation. So, man, I adopt that. I embrace that. But it's also written, without him, I can do nothing. He goes on to say that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Let that sink in. How many people are puffed up one against another? And when you talk to them, it's all based in flesh. It's they only know themselves after the flesh, living after the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 there says that we don't know Jesus after the flesh. Everyone in here probably knows Jesus. But how do you know him? You know him after the spirit and after the word of God. As a matter of fact, if you know Jesus today, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they started saying, well, some say Elijah, some John the Baptist. Others went on. But who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And, and Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. But my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus got frustrated with the other disciples in John chapter 14, verse 9, when Philip said, hey, just show us the Father. Would you show us the Father? I, I think Jesus was bald by the time the cross came, pulling his hair out. <laughs> Have I been with you so long? And do you not know who I am? You cannot know Jesus after the flesh. You can only know Jesus after the Spirit and after the Scriptures. You'll only know yourself, your new self, after the Scriptures and after the Spirit. It's a revelation. You have to have a revelation from God of who you are in Christ to overcome. They're all puffed up because one, one has this skin tone. I mean, we literally live in a world that how can there be a, a white supremacist in the, in the world? But then again, how, how then could there be a group that only black lives matter? Both are after the flesh. Amen. Everybody say, I love Brother Dwayne. Man, I feel better. Amen. It's flesh. It leads to death, division. Separation. Aren't you glad in the cross we're all reconciled unto God, both Jew, Gentile, bond, free, black, white, male, female? We need to, do, we need to see some reconciliation. I saw it. It happened 2,000 years ago. If you'll come unto Jesus, he'll reconcile us by the blood of the cross. He'll make us all one man. We all came out of one man messed up, and now we can get back in the second man, Jesus Christ. And be right with God and one another. Man, look at this next thing. It's over the top. You're puffed up.
God. That's the way the Pentecostal said it when I grew up. God. G-A-W-D. God. I started to say I'm not making fun, but I think I am. I get nervous when somebody says, God. I kind of duck. But I have been made an heir of God. And a joint heir with Jesus. I got nothing in one way. And I got everything in another way. And it makes life exciting. Number three, this is the one people don't like, so I'll hurry. Uh, Go to 1 Corinthians 8. I'm going to lose the crowd, but I'll get you back. I promise. Just hang on. Don't move. Don't respond. I was ministered on adultery one time, trying to deal with adultery and how that we, we need to be faithful to our spouses. And a man jumped up in the middle of my message and cussed me out as he left the church. I didn't know he was having an affair. He should have stayed cool. Yeah. <laughs> He should have just sat there, nodded his head, and acted spiritual. That's right. That's right, brother. That adultery is not good. It wasn't smart to jump up. Cuss me out. Showing everybody who was of God. And walk away. So when I say this, just be cool. Just go. Just look at your neighbor and say, that's awesome. That's good. Yeah. That man doesn't have a clue, but but that was good. That was good. Are you ready? Number three. Without God, you know nothing. Without God, you know nothing. Boy, you talk about bowing up. The whole culture bows up on this one. Everybody at church bows up. We're proud of what we think we know. We're proud of our thoughts. We're proud of our ways. We think we're pretty sharp people. But look at what the scriptures say. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know. I love those scriptures. We know. And every time I read them, I go, not really. (laughs) You just have to pastor a while. And it's like, well, it says we know this. How come we don't know it? We know that we all have knowledge. Well, wait a minute. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. He's not saying we're, we're all dumber than rocks. He's simply saying we have to understand that all knowledge comes from God. That we would have no knowledge. And listen, I love you. But even revelation knowledge and what God has shown you. Compared to what God still knows about it. You know piddle and little. Isn't that edifying? Doesn't that make you feel good? Man, why did I come to a church where a preacher could stand up there and tell me I'm dumber than a rock? I didn't say you were dumber than a rock. Just close. We're not smart. But we think we're smart. This whole generation thinks they know everything. They think they know good and evil. They think they know the way that is the right way to live your life to be happy. They're puffed up with knowledge. And even in the church, a lot of times people get a revelation, true knowledge from God, straight from God, but they think it's exhaustive. Everything God has ever told you is but a layer of an onion. And when you get a revelation of God, it's the first layer. Oh, thank you, God. That's awesome. But you're supposed to discover there's another layer of that same same truth. You peel that back. And then you go, oh, my gosh, there's another layer. And before you know it, you're (laughs) bawling. We think we know so much. A lot of people have a hard time at church, even with a message, because we don't tickle their ears enough They know so much. I mean, I'll hear people, they'll quit a church and they'll go somewhere else and they'll go, there was no meat there. They they weren't feeding me. Signifying of their babyhood out loud. Because you only feed babies. That's right. That's right. You only spoon feed babies. Adults 
feed themselves. That'll hit you later. I'll be on the road going home. Where's the beef? Young people, you'll have to Google that. Where's the beef? And then you come along and you try to explain milk and what it really means and what meat is. And their babyhood surfaces again. Their immaturity surfaces again. I don't have time to massage this, but Jesus said one time, I have meat that you know not of. And my meat is to do the will of my Father. People on meat are acting on their faith and they're producers in the kingdom of God. People on milk have to sit and get past being offended and angry and pitching a fit. In the spirit world at many churches, uh, a lot of people are in the aisle foaming at the mouth doing a 360 because you told them to repent. Told him you got to change your mind. Without God, we know nothing. What's, what's healthy about that, preacher? It makes me dependent upon God for knowledge and for more revelation knowledge that changes lives. Number four, last one, last one. Without him, without him. And again, in one way, we know nothing. <laughs> I got in a hurry. In one way, I know nothing, but then 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus has been made unto me all wisdom. 1 John 2.20 and 27 will blow your mind. And if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, you'll never understand 1 John 2.20 and verse 27. 1 John 2.20 says you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. (laughs) I used to read that and go, okay, I've got this anointing, unction from the Holy One, and I know all things. Then in verse 27, it says, and that same unction teaches you all things. Well, if I know all things, why do I still have to be taught all things? Because I know all things in my spirit. In my spirit, the hidden wisdom of God and treasures of knowledge in Christ are on the inside of me. In my spirit. And in my spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, I have the mind of Christ. The very mind of Christ is in my spirit, man. But up here, I have to be taught what I already know down here. Amen. All right, last one. Last one, and, uh, you know, maybe get some of the crowd back. Um, Without him, we are nothing. We are nothing without God. I'll close with 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at what Paul said in verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul never forgot the pit. Paul never forgot the pit God found him in. I'm going to say it again. Paul never forgot I used to be Saul, the persecutor, and God found me in a pit. But then he cut me out of the rock. And now I'm no longer Saul, the persecutor. I'm, I'm Paul, the preacher. Hallelujah. But he didn't forget. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. I, I held the coats of them that stoned Stephen. I pulled people out of their churches and into the synagogues and beat them. I put them in prison. He never forgot. But look at the next verse. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Grace made me an apostle. Yep. I'm nothing after the flesh. I'm not even worthy to do what I do. But I'm not going to live after the flesh. Grace has made me an apostle. I said I'd quit, but I've got to cover one more scripture. Am I okay, Pastor? Just one more. Yep. Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. Most amazing statement I'm not going to spend the time on it I wanted. But I want to bring out the amazing statement. Paul is talking about in being in prison. And in verse 19, he talks about how all this is going to turn out for his good, even though he's in prison. 
And then he makes mention in verse 20 of the hope and, and how that God will be glorified. If he, if he dies in prison, God will be glorified. If he lives, God will be glorified. Look at verse 21. For me to live, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he talks about how he wants to go home and it'd be better for him if he went home. But then he's going to stay because it's better for them because they needed teaching. That's a pretty cool dude. That you're standing there and you can either go home and be with Jesus that's better. Or you can stay and keep helping people to grow up into Jesus. And he says, I'm going to stay because you need me. (laughs) But before that, he says, for me to live is Christ. What a bold statement. I was preaching this years ago and somebody got up mad and and they made, again, their anger known uh, that I was a cult and that I just said I was God. Right in front of everybody. Got up and, and said that. That you heard him say he was God because I said for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. Let me, let me clear things up quickly. Number one, I'm too dumb to be God. Number two, you're too smart to think I'm God. You're supposed to go, that was good. You should have gave me a, a clap on that one. You know, no, that's a welfare clap. I don't want it. He's saying... That this mystery that was hid from generations in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 is Christ is in us. The hope of glory. No matter how weak you you feel. No matter how unworthy you feel. No matter how unqualified you feel. Christ is in you the hope of glory. It doesn't matter how you feel. It's real. You don't contact it with your feelings. Contact it by faith and according to the word of God. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. And the life I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Your spirit is united to Jesus' spirit. And Ephesians chapter 5 says, you're flesh of the Lord's flesh and bone of the Lord's bones. It's in your spirit. It's real. And for you to live is Christ. For you to die is gain. I'll quit with this. I love tea. I like tea. I really like sun tea. And years ago, we were making sun tea. And you take a pitcher of water and you take a tea bag. You put it in the pitcher of water. You set it in the sun. And a miracle happens. It's glorious. It starts changing colors. And then your imagination could just run with you with all the all the different images as that as that tea bag is immersed into that water. And as that tea bag is engrafted to that water, and that water is engrafted to that tea bag, it's just marvelous. It's miraculous. Then you take the tea bag out of the water, you throw it in the trash. But what do you call the water? What do you call it? Be bold, it's not a setup. What do you call the water? Tea. Tea. Oh, no, 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 that's the water. The tea is in the trash. But the tea had such a profound effect on the water, and the water got in the tea, and the tea got in the water, that you separated the tea, but there was such an infusion, such an engrafting, such a communion, such a a union with the tea bag and the water, you call the water tea. You're You're not dumb, you know that's the water, and you know the tea's in the trash. But that profound effect it had on it, you call the water tea. God the Father knows that Jesus Christ, His Son, by the Holy Spirit has been shed abroad in our hearts. And He is seated at the right hand of the Father, but the Father looks at the church and goes, tea! He looks at you and He goes, the body of Christ. Well, wait a minute, Christ is at the right hand of the Father. That's what the Bible says. Well, the Bible says you're his body. 
Before he got to the right hand of the Father, he got into your heart. And there was an engrafting into your heart, into your spirit. And there was this miraculous merging and communion. Where I'm not stupid. I know Jesus is Jesus. And I am me. But we be T. And when Jesus looks at me, he goes, sweet tea. (laughs) Never forget who you are, a chip off the old block. And never forget the pit that God took you out of. But thank God for the father of our faith, that we can walk by faith now and not by sight. And thank God for our mother, Sarah. And now we can bear much fruit in Jesus. Amen. God bless you.